All right, everybody, welcome to the third installment of the Organizing the Green New Deal course. Uh, tonight, we have a really, really exciting class and interview uh, with Dio Rio Francos, who is a professor of political science at Providence College and also a author of this very cool book, Resource Radicals, which I'm about halfway through right now and I very well written and I recommend that folks pick up a copy. Um, we are going to talk to her tonight about all sorts of stuff related to her work and research and action um, and politics, I think. And um, yeah, we'll just kind of get right into it. Um, I am really, really enjoying reading your book right now. And I think the articles that you shared with the class were fantastic. Um, there's a lot of different subject matter in there that we could go into tonight. So I just wanted to, to kind of let you frame a little bit of what you see your scope of research and action as. Like, where, where what are the things that you're most interested in right now? Sure. Um, thanks so much for having me. Uh, this is, uh, this looks like such an amazing series uh, that the overall um, lineup and, and syllabus, um, and I'm excited to meet people a little bit more when we get into Q&A later. Um, so I work on many different things, though I think that they're connected to one another. Uh, primarily, my work has, well, actually, let me, let me step back a little bit and, and refer to the book that you just showed. So kind of historically, as it were, my work has focused a lot on resource extraction. And that was what um, I found very interesting uh, about uh, Latin American politics over the past couple of decades has been the ways in which resources have been politicized uh, by different grassroots groups in different ways, uh, critiqued in different ways, lots of innovative tactics under the sort of banner of an anti-extractive movement that really came into being, especially uh, around the turn of this millennium. So that is what I did my dissertation work on as a graduate student. That's what the, this book is based on, Resource Radicals. And that has really informed a lot of my thinking as, a, as an eco-socialist and as someone that is very committed to a transformative Green New Deal in the US has been the sort of vantage point that is internationalist and that is grounded in um, knowledge of concrete struggles over resources, over territory um, and over kind of more broadly like what elect transformative project ought to look like uh, in the 21st century. And so a lot of my thinking on these topics has been really inflected by movements and by critical uh, thought coming out of Latin America. Um, uh, so that's a really broad way to put my trajectory. Um, I've sort of brought that those different orientations into what is my current academic work, though academic slash political, I should say, because because I hope we'll see that it has um, uh, kind of it inflects my, my activism and advocacy work that I do. But my current research project relates to the resource extraction needed for a green transition, for a, a low carbon economy, for an economy uh, that functions on renewable energy. So I kind of took that interest in extraction that had really been um, inspired by anti-extractive movements in, in Latin America and thought, well, where do climate change and extraction intersect? Because it's not, it's not immediately obvious, especially if we think about, as I'm sure the people in this collective do, we think about confronting climate change as necessitating a sort of keep it in the ground ethic and politics, right? So the idea is we don't want to extract coal or gas or, or oil. We want to leave them where they are underground and instead run our societies on renewable energy. So it might seem a little counterintuitive to think about what are the extractive requirements of a renewable energy powered society? And it turns out, and I've learned you know, a huge amount since I started this project in 2019, um, it turns out that a lot of uh, minerals that come out of the earth are needed to create the technologies that allow us to harness solar power and wind power and geothermal, and also allow us to do all sorts of other things like electrifying buildings, um, uh, uh, or transforming the grid um, or building transmission lines, right? So the, the, the kind of renewable energy revolution, which is we're seeing the beginnings of and I hope speeds up and, and continues to unfold, uh, is it requires its own very physical, very concrete, very material built environment. And that built environment 
uh, of, of technology and of infrastructure, just like any other built environment, requires stuff that comes out of, out of the earth that is extracted. So it turns out that there's quite a bit of intersection between climate change and extraction, um, even as we try to keep certain things uh, certainly in in the ground and not use them at all anymore. And so where this kind of background and looking at extractive sectors and the conflict around them in Latin America, and then this, uh, my political and very deep kind of advocacy interest in, in climate change kind of intersected specifically is looking at the extractive frontiers of green technologies um, and specifically of lithium batteries, which we can get into why those are important um, if folks don't already know. Um, but I was interested in lithium batteries as a green technology, as a technology that is uh, absolutely essential to, to decarbonizing, but also as a technology that is rather mineral intensive in its, um, in its manufacturing. Uh, and specifically, I looked at the, the uh, um, mineral referenced in, in, the, in the word lithium ion batteries, which is lithium, right? They, they, it involves cobalt and nickel and manganese and other things as well, but I decided to focus on lithium. And one reason I decided to focus on lithium is because lithium, um, one of the main places that lithium is sourced from is South America. So that kind of brings in my longstanding interest in South America and this intersection between climate change and extraction and this very potent political ethical and environmental question of how are we going to source the extractive material requirements for green technology? How are we going to do so in a way that doesn't replicate the harm of existing extractive practices, certainly does not replicate the harm of a long history of fossil capitalism and the way that it has unequally impacted um, uh, the world. Um, and while still constructing and producing and deploying the technology that is needed in order to transition to a different energy system. So I'll kind of pause it there. Um, I could say more about any of these things and I'm sure that Nick will ask me about them. And, and the, I'll just end it by saying that I think about this academically. Um, I think about it in my research and I also think about it as a concrete political praxis and I'm super involved with uh, the Democratic Socialists of America and our National Green New Deal work. And so this is something that comes up for me, uh, again, both as a research concern, but also as something that I think we need to work out in, in praxis, as it were, um, in, in our advocacy for a Green New Deal. Yeah, I'd love to maybe start, um, I mean, there's so much here to get into. I, I'd love to maybe start in the kind of like, uh, the particular and specific impacts of some of the research that you've done. Um, a couple of these articles, you know, you'd mentioned, um, you know, lithium in these different contexts, whether it's in these kind of like meetings with professionals who are trying to trade in lithium versus people who are living in environments where lithium being extracted and how that's hurting water. Uh, you mentioned, you know, an experience uh, watching litigation happen around rights of nature and how <clears throat> courts were sort of like saying this was a, 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 a point of general interest. I think they call like a public interest versus like a particularized or a specific interest or something like that. I wonder if we might start at the, the specific interest and, and you can tell us a little bit maybe more about the theme and your experiences there. Sure. Should I, um, so just to make sure I understand the question well, and I like the connections that you drew, do you want me to talk about the specific harms that are associated with lithium extraction or did you want me to speak more to my uh research experiences because i might answer those in slightly different ways so you tell me which was more Let's start with the, the harms okay. the dog, that's the dog is, is excited yeah. about the learning yeah. about the harms um <laughs> um yeah so i i can i can get into this and actually this is a good place to just say what we need lithium for, uh, lithium batteries for, because I never like to assume that, that people, even among what I assume is a super well-informed uh, audience like the one that we have today, but uh, I, wanna, I wanna make sure that everyone's on the same page about this. So lithium ion batteries are in our laptops, in our cell phones, in any rechargeable electronic device, right? But that's a very small amount of lithium because those um, those mobile devices are sort of by their nature quite small, handheld, whatever it is, right? So that's not where the main kind of demand source is going to be coming from over time. 
the main thing that is the main development that is pushing a lot of lithium demand is electric vehicles and that you know you can look at if i were better prepared i would have slides for you but they're very easy to find um online like you can just look out projecting out to like 2030 and there's this like increasing exponentially increasing demand for lithium because of its use in the batteries that power electric vehicles uh there is another use of, of lithium that's also important to note which is uh, renewable energy grids uh, that function on solar or, or, or wind especially, so therefore have intermittent power sources, need lithium batteries in order to um, calibrate supply and demand. They need a storage system basically. So like an enormous, a utility scale battery is much larger. Um, but, but even though utility scale batteries are larger, the main thing driving um, uh, lithium demand is electric vehicles because so many more of them are, are produced and projected to be produced uh, than grid scale batteries. So that's what lithium is used for and why it's important for the climate crisis. What lithium does in the environments or what the extraction, as I should say, of lithium does is, is another issue. And that's that was Nick's direct question. So I'll, I'll answer that now. And it, it depends a bit on the type of deposit that we're looking at. Lithium is by the way, a rather abundant mineral, and maybe we'll get to this uh, later in the conversation, but there's actually quite a bit of lithium in the US, for example, so it's not something that only exists like out there in other countries, uh, but it is primarily extracted from Australia, Chile, China, and Argentina. Um, and in those different landscapes, there are different types of deposits, so there lithium can exist in clay deposits, um, in hard rock spodumene deposits and in the type of deposits that I look at, which are brine deposits. So I'll speak to those particularly um, because the environmental issues, the immediate ecosystem kind of harms of, of extraction and brine deposits are what has actually um, uh, been discussed a lot in environmental circles and also in, in, in investigative reporting on this. So I think that that might be most interesting to speak about. So in South America, there is a, um, transnational region that overlays Bolivia, Argentina, and Chile. And it is called by industry people the quote lithium triangle. I don't like that term and activists don't like that term. And I think it's somewhat apparent why because it sort of just like refu refers to these complex ecosystems just by the commodity that's extracted from them, right? But regardless, that's what it's called in the sort of mainstream press. And this lithium triangle um, is in a beautiful, breathtakingly beautiful region of South America that's in the highlands in the where the Andean mountains are. Many of these Andean mountains are volcanic. volcanic. It's a very dramatic landscape that's kind of like a very high level plateau. And on this plateau um, are salt flats. And these might be familiar to people that have visited the Western United States. There's some similar geological formations there. So these white gray expanses that go all the way to the horizon ringed by volcanic mountains um, and that are like knobby and crunchy while you're walking around on them in, in your hiking boots. And, and right underneath those salt flats are these brine deposits. So salt water deposits, salty water, like seawater, but actually more salty than seawater. And in that salt water dissolved, um, suspended is lithium among other uh, uh, minerals that are valuable um, like potassium and other things. So. Um, that the way that lithium extraction works is it's it, it, in brine deposits. It's very different than what you might think of with traditional hard rock mining. It's almost like interacting with ecosystems to get something valuable out of them. And so what happens is uh, the, the brine is just sucked out with like straws almost, right? So like you suck out this, this brine using pressure and then the brine, the liquid, is arrayed on these enormous, like many football fields, like enormous evaporation ponds, right? On these highland desert plateaus ringed by the volcanic mountains. I'm just trying to give the setting a little bit because it's it's dramatic, but it also gives you a sense of what's at stake in terms of of the ecosystems and their and their intrinsic value. So um, the the brine is with lithium in it is arrayed in these evaporation ponds, and when we're talking about Chile specifically which is where I did field work in, in 2019, uh, the Atacama Desert, which is where this all takes place, is the second driest place on earth after Antarctica. Um, so you have a tremendous amount of solar radiation there. And basically the, the, the sun um, and with some help from the wind does the work of evaporating the water um, that, that, the, that the lithium is suspended in and concentrating the lithium. Now, so far, this might actually sound like a relatively uninvasive process, right? But it does actually have some pretty dramatic 
effects that are only beginning to be studied in the scientific literature, but that indigenous communities that live in this region have been anecdotally observing for a long time now, because in Chile, you have a few decades of lithium extraction at this point, and it's only increasing with the increasing demand. So by sucking the brine outside, out of the, the salt flats, what ends up happening is that the water, the fresh water, so not the salt water, the fresh water, that's part of the same hydrological system, um, is the, the water table in effect. And this, I'm gonna be very brief here because it's a little bit technical to explain, but um, just bear with me. Basically the water table, the fresh water table is pulled down gravitationally. You're sucking something out of the center of a salt flat and the fresh water that begins around the perimeter of the salt flat is in effect gravitationally pulled down by that. So all this means in simple words is that the extraction of brine makes fresh water less accessible. And this is something that, that indigenous campesinos um, uh, that live in the area, there's 18 indigenous communities that ring the salt flat where all the lithium in Chile is extracted have noticed. It is compounded by the way, by the freshwater use of copper extraction, which also occurs in the same region. Copper, another commodity that's really, and raw material that's really important for the green economy because everything's electrified. That means everything needs copper wires. And it's also, um, ironically, exacerbated by climate change, right? Because the, you know, we know that deserts are getting drier um, and, and, the, and the Atacama Desert is no exception. So we have this really intense social conflict happening right now over water um, in the de this desert region where lithium is extracted. The, the one other thing that I will, or two other just uh, harmful effects that I'll note uh, is that the brine itself, despite what mining companies say, is itself ecologically valuable. They'll say, oh, the brine doesn't matter because no one drinks brine, which is true. Humans don't drink brine, but microorganisms live in brine and larger fauna like, uh, um, like these beautiful flamingos that are endemic to the region. So they're, the salt flat that I described has flamingos on it, right? These flamingos eat organisms that are suspended in the brine. Um, uh, so, so you get the idea. This is a complex ecosystem and just removing something that is naturally there has effects downstream um, on different species habitats. And there's some scientific evidence that it's affecting migration patterns and, and sort of species populations in addition. And the last harm that I'll mention, which is um, last but not least, I, I would say it's among the most important harms is that indigenous communities that I mentioned, um, the Atacameño communities um, that ring the salt flat, uh, have not been, you know, by any stretch of the imagination, properly consulted, let alone consented, um, to these huge extractive processes that are happening. There have been various forms of like corporate uh, negotiations with communities that are very asymmetrical, but there hasn't been like a legally enforced right as there should be um, in Chile uh, is party to various conventions that, that require it to enforce the right to prior consultation. And this really has not occurred. And so there's social harms, there's environmental harms, water is a particularly um, salient point of contention. Uh, and this is where the lithium that ends up in green technology comes from, or one of the two main places that it comes from, the other being Australia. Great. And it, it fits in so well with what you have written elsewhere about in terms of um, basically like resource frontiers and, you know, in what world systems they call sort of the peripheries um, as being like far more integral and important to global capitalism is that they're acknowledged. Um, there's a quote from article Season Resist that, that you wrote that I really like. Um, it's an actual existing capitalism has always relied on the globally uneven cheapening of labor and nature, the sacrifice of far flung lives and ecosystems at the altar of relentless production and the constant expulsion of populations alternately surplus and surplus exploited. Uh, it sounds like that in the, the sort of like minerals that are needed for green industries that presently the system is reproducing the same sorts of resource frontier harmful effects that we've seen in past resource extractive moments. Yeah, it's absolutely, it's absolutely true. So um, I, I, one thing to just note about this to kind of frame this, I could have said this in response to your first question, um, and, and this will directly address what you're bringing up now is that the the green technology um, green technology sectors so that includes what I've mentioned like lithium batteries that includes electric vehicles wind turbines solar panels um, uh, all of the um, built environment of of transmission lines of offshore wind all of the this whole infrastructure that we need to build that is already being built um, green technologies in their sum total 
are so mineral intensive in terms of the volume and variety of minerals that they require to be built that analysts, market analysts, are predicting what's called a commodity super cycle. What a commodity super cycle is, is these unusual moments economically um, in economic history where a whole host of different raw materials see um, really dramatic demand increases and dramatic price increases. And people that read like the business press or, or sort of remember this moment might remember that starting in roughly 2000 and going through 2014, there was a commodity super cycle that was in large part driven by um, the rapid growth in China, rapid industrialization. That was China's period of most intensive industrialization. And that played out really intensely in Latin America, which is the setting for resource radicals, the book that, that Nick um, um, showed, my book that Nick, Nick showed before, because this intensive, this demand driven primarily, but not exclusively from China, Intent, incentivized a lot of new extractive projects in Latin America. Latin America is a place in the world like the rest of the global south, but particularly so, that is very oriented towards, um, its economic model is very oriented towards the extraction of raw materials and their export to global markets, right? So commodity super cycle are just these, you know, unusual moments where not just oil, not just beef, not just cotton, but like 10 or 20 different commodities see dramatically increased demand. And this is all to just say that the green technologies that we need to mitigate climate change or, and or adapt to it, um, depending on the technology in question, are so mineral intensive that their rapid production and deployment, which everyone is predicting and is, which, which is beginning to happen, may spur another commodity super cycle, meaning another frenzied moment of just a really dramatic expansion of extraction of raw materials that will be primarily, not exclusively, but primarily in the global south, and they will be sold on global markets um, uh, uh, through commodities markets. So that gives you a sense of just how, um, how like environmentally intensive some of these technologies are, which is not at all to say that we shouldn't electrify transit or produce solar panels, but it is to say that these currently have some serious environmental costs and, and costs in terms of human labor exploitation and, and ethical concerns around human rights, because the system under which all of this raw material extraction is happening and being bought and sold and then being used as inputs into manufacturing processes that entire system is just the same system of global capitalism that with important shifts, you know, depending on the moment, has existed more or less for like 500 years and has some pretty entrenched power hierarchies and relations of, of, of power and, and economic and ecological inequality that market. And so, you know, we're in this sort of brave new moment of um, the production of, of green technologies and the shift hopefully away from a fossil fuel system. but everything about the way that moment is being produced is being shaped by pre-existing class relations, pre-existing racial hierarchies, um, and pre-existing what, what scholars refer to as unequal ecological exchange, meaning that some communities, including communities here in the US, right? This is not just about global north versus the global south, because these hierarchies are structured all the way down, and including within nations, right? But we, we can get to that more, more later. But the point is that pre-existing structures of inequality are really shaping um, how this transition is playing out. And I think that that is most dramatically apparent at the extractive frontiers. It's most dramatically apparent at the places at which nature, human labor, and capital kind of meet to wrest from the earth the raw materials required to generate what later is called clean technology as if it had no earthly origins. I really liked the metaphor um, that was in um, the season resist uh, article about the inverted uh, mine. And I wonder, and, and it was, you know, calling on folks to realize that the stuff that builds our city is the stuff that resources us even in, you know, primarily, I guess we call them like human centered ecologies, uh, comes from somewhere. And like, I really like that, that metaphor. I wonder if you'd expand on that a little bit and how that impacts your research as well. Yeah, I love that metaphor too, and I didn't, I didn't invent it. Um, I took it from so, so that essay. I'm partly reviewing a book and kind of also riffing on it to think about some of these broader issues. And the book is Planetary Mind. I super recommend it. Um, and 
the author Martina Arboleda uses this inverted mindscape metaphor, which he then takes from another author who I cite in there and I'm blanking on, on his name, but he has a history of San Francisco um, and, it's and it's unexpected relationships to like the mining economy. And the, the inverted mindscape is, is a metaphor that, that refers to two different things or has two different kind of origins. One is that the um, a lot of the built environment that we associate with urban life, so things like really tall buildings with um, with the vent with forms of ventilation, with air shafts, with um, with internal lighting, with elevators, right? So the, the kind of just skyscraper, let's put it that way, kind of built environment that we associate with like New York City, Tokyo, London, all of these major metropolises, San Francisco. A lot of the actual kind of technologies to ha to move humans up and down vertically and to light internal kind of spaces came from underground. Came from actually the history of developing um, uh, tunnel and shaft mining un underneath the earth, right? So that's one interesting kind of like, huh? These skyscrapers were actually developed, modeled on mines. Um, that's one origin of that metaphor. The other is a broader point that doesn't just have to do with skyscrapers, which touches back on some of our themes that we've already developed, which is that the in, the world around us, um, as modern and gleaming as it looks, as much as like you know developments in chemistry and all sorts of synthetic fabrication, is certainly a part of of modernity and and late capitalism. Everything around us has its origins in some kind of natural process, right? Like whether it's it's what I look at, which is raw materials that are extracted from the earth, whether it's raw materials that are harvested through agriculture, whether it's the use of energy um, or water um, or other ecosystem processes and services, right? So, you know, when we look around us, it, you know, if we could kind of have some some magic goggles that just showed, we could actually see and trace all of the raw materials that went into producing the world around us but i think even more interestingly and picking up on nick's questions all of the social and natural relations of inequality that sort of produce these end results of the cities that we walk around in right and so what i'm trying to do and what a lot of scholars um, um in 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 the traditions i work in are trying to do is kind of like trace those commodities from the final product in which it's hard to actually see and mark's talked about this as the commodity fetishism, like we look at these objects and we can at all see the deep relationships of, of inequality and exploitation that they actually encode and, and were produced by. So to kind of take a final product, in this case, a lithium battery and trace it to its extractive frontiers, trace it also to other nodes of conflict and power and decision-making that are part of the whole process that brings it into being, right? So I think inversion is just a technique that we can use it doesn't you know doesn't always have to apply to mining or to skyscrapers but it is like a critical technique to kind of uncover what in some ways is is hidden from us um uh by kind of by ideology and by other kind of processes under capitalism awesome um i'm going to take an a question from the the crowd now uh mitch green who is going to talk to us in two weeks on green new deal economics um asks, uh, he says, I really appreciate your commitment to the political economy and institutional structuring of resource production and extraction. Do you think that environmental economists have anything to offer or are they too committed to a methodology that sees the economy as divorced from social and ecological spaces? So kind of taking on that, are, are there disciplines, I mean, the traditional, even the sort of, you know, we'll call them lefty economic spaces sometimes or environmental economics, do they see the world as we need to see it in order to really appreciate this? And you, you can, you don't have to attack other disciplines if you don't want to. No, it's okay. It's okay. Um, not not always. I mean, to the question, meaning, and, and to your to your addition to the question, I think that 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 in, you know there are um, people that I consider um, really great heterodox and left wing economists who do excellent work around social policy, for example, that don't haven't you know departed from from some of these uh, guiding assumptions um, uh, that guide economics, but also guide you know, other disciplines, um, uh, other academic disciplines. But let me actually use the opportunity to speak about someone's work that I'm learning more about that I think um, does depart very, very much so from from the assumptions that that Mitch is drawing our attention to. The assumptions being, uh, as Mitch renders it, kind of this uh, binary of like society or economy on one side and nature on the other side, a binary that doesn't allow us to understand the ways in which economies are always imbricated in natural processes um, and often are harming those natural processes, right, as, as we have under fossil capitalism. But um, 
the the work of the and I think she refers to herself as an ecological economist. I don't know if that's different than environmental economist, but anyway, her name is Julia Steinberger, and her work is is I'm just getting to know it. Um, I've been reading some of her articles, and it is is really worth looking into because I think she takes on these assumptions very head on uh, assumptions around GDP, assumptions around growth, um, and really imbricates the economy in its in its like socio-natural setting. Um, and one of the, the, the terms that, that she uses that I like a lot, which she is not the author of, but she's expanded on, uh, she's not the originator of this term, but she's expanded on a lot. And it links to some of other topics. So I'll, I'm happy to have an opportunity to talk about it, which is um, she, instead of sent in, so right now, um, the way that all of these green technologies are produced and anything else is produced under capitalism, you know, the t-shirts we're wearing, the laptops, everything, um, are referred to generally as supply chains. Um, and that's the term I use um, for what it's worth. Um, I think it is a useful way to describe capitalist relations. But, you know, the question is like, you know, what supply chains, the, the, the downside of them is they have this metaphor of kind of like a linear relationship of point A to point B. And the other downside, more to Mitch's point, is that they kind of view nature as just this like endless supply of stuff to eventually make its way into finished commodities, right? And she, drawing on this other author whose name is escaping me right now, instead says, what if we organize production um, based on needs, right? Needs for survival, but also needs for flourishing and happiness and pleasure and all these other things. And so they, instead of supply chains, think about what an economy would look like if it was based on their term systems of provision rather than supply chains. And she uses this concept to actually totally break down the sort of nature versus economy um, uh, binary, um, but also to think about what a economy centered on human and natural kind of need would look like. I just leave that there, but I would look into her work um, uh, and I, I appreciate the question a lot. Awesome. Um, so uh, kind of back to a question that I was, I was threw into another question because I was so interested in how this played out. Um, but, you know, Ecuador, and we'll talk, I think this maybe is a transition in talking to Ecuador more, um, but, you know, I guess you could say that in some sense, Ecuador recognized that there were these rights that needed to be applied to nature and that, you know, they were, they were worried about the harms around past forms of colonialism and extractivism before. And so they actually enshrined in law protections over, over nature. And then when those things were actually kind of like litigated, you saw uh, a state um, and the companies that it was sort of stepping in for basically just saying, mm, actually, it's not really that important. And it kind of, uh, as a lawyer, you know, I look at something like that and, and think a lot about how the law is an expression of the broader political economy a lot of times. And so we can't rely necessarily on like formal rights to, to protect us. Um, so I guess, you know, the question around this is, um, you know, you were there. So I, I think it was like interesting to sort of see how that experience went, but what, how did the dynamic in Ecuador play out generally where you had left governments coming in ostensibly justice focused? And, and then that led to a series of priorities and, and let's call them rights playing against each other, who won and why? And what did you learn? Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a really fascinating case. And, and I won't get into the present moment in Ecuador right now in case there are questions about it. I don't wanna sort of preempt them, but suffice to say that what I'm about to say and what is analyzed in my book is like much more relevant to the current electoral context in Ecuador than I ever would have actually even predicted it despite me thinking that these dynamics around uh, extractivism and the state and whatever are very important. I didn't predict that they'd play out to be um, so important in the current elections. So if folks want to know about that, I'm happy to speak about it. But let me go back in history a little bit. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, in the first decade and a half of this millennium, there was this tremendous commodity boom. And it really affected Latin America, particularly um, even uh, compared to other regions in the global south. And Ecuador uh, is no exception. And in fact, Ecuador is particularly exemplary of, of the way in which the commodity boom played out in Latin America. Because Ecuador, uh, along with Venezuela uh, and a few other countries, is one of the most resource-dependent economies uh, in Latin America, meaning it's 
it is it's um it it's state budget for example generally about a third of the state budget comes from oil revenues so it is it is a country that most of its exports almost all of its exports are are raw materials or natural resources and and its state its political system also really depends on the continued extraction and export of those resources in order to have a budget to pay for social services right this has long been the case in ecuador um this didn't wasn't invented by the commodity boom uh, or by the governments that were empowered during it but it was exacerbated this this fact was sort of exacerbated during the commodity boom due, due to um the in, quick rise in, in prices for oil and, and for minerals that, that Ecuador exports, among other things. Um, so at the same time that there was this commodity boom at, uh, overlapping with it, a left government came to power for the first time since Ecuador was democratized. Uh, so throughout Ecuador's history, uh, uh, demo recent democratic history, which starts in 1979, there had not really been a government that I would call a consistently left. So the Correa government, Rafael Correa, who was elected in 2006, comes to power in 2007, was Ecuador's first democratically left wing, elected left wing government. He comes into power um, almost at the height of this commodity boom, right? Right, maybe a little bit before the the, the height of this commodity boom. Um, and so it's a it's an intersection, right? We often we talk about political economy, and Nick used the term to think about how politics and economics interact. And so here's a very good example: there was this change in global markets driven by economic processes, and it intersected with a political trajectory, which was the election of a left wing government that election itself owes owes its owes its existence to decades prior of grassroots organizing right just like we would only imagine someone like bernie coming to power right actually coming to power for example in the us like with really concerted grassroots organizing that mobilized you know masses of people and korea no different so korea came to power because of movements that came before him that opened up space for a left wing political option in ecuador um, and what this does is it is it sets up a series, a set of dilemmas, and Nick sort of pointed to them in his question, which is that a left wing government comes to power during a commodity boom. On the one hand, this commodity boom, which which fills the state coffers with more money than had you know been around for a long time, primarily because of oil prices, uh, allows this left wing government to govern from from the left, meaning it allows the left wing government to spend a lot of money on social services that these movements have been demanding to redistribute, to um, build lots of infrastructure that was sorely needed to improve existing infrastructure, to do all of the things that left wing governments tend to promise when they come into power, but often can't do precisely, especially in the global south because of financial constraints, right? And so Korea is able to deliver on these promises. At the same time, as you can already get the sense of from earlier our earlier conversation, this meant more extraction, right? And more extraction means more forms of social conflict at the in the zones of extraction. And particularly in Ecuador, that meant conflict with the same indigenous communities and movements that had been part of that long-term trajectory that brought Korea to power. So it's a real like dilemma and contradiction within the left. Leftist movements that were anti-capitalist and anti-imperialist that had demanded, um, you know, a, a left-wing politics and got it in the form of Korea, um, then came into conflict with him as he sought to expand an extractive economy that was also indirectly the basis of his widespread popular support, right? Meaning that people that may not have been involved in movements, because even in societies where you have a lot you know, of social movement activity, not every individual they might still be a minority of people, right? You have just lots of poor and working class people that may or may not be politically activated, but that are benefiting from the social services that Korea's spent oil, oil and mineral fueled spending allows for, right? So it's a whole set of contradictions of like the people that are most affected by extraction versus people that might benefit from its economic um, revenues, but are not as directly affected by extraction. So maybe poor people living in cities, there's a contradiction, you know, between different left visions of like a left anti extractive vision versus a vision of let's use these resources for the people and, and to address popular needs. Um, there's, you know, a contradiction of just being left wing and relying so much on global markets um, for your economic model, right? So there's like a whole set of dilemmas that this opens up. Um, but what I found very interesting, and this is going to circle back to my first few sentences in this event is that it just really pushed at the edges of what I personally had previously thought about like what is the relationship between 
a transformative left-wing project and the environment and resource extraction, especially in the peripheries of the global economy, of an unequal global economy in the global south, where due to those power relations, um, options are more limited in terms of how you can address people's needs. But these questions recur in the global north as well, right? Like in the US, a Green New Deal, like how are we going to balance these different imperatives, um, not just the extractive requirements of green technology, which I already talked about, but all sorts of dilemmas that always pervade uh, the pathway to power for the left um, in, in a system that is still capitalist um, on a global scale as well as on a national scale. Yeah, and it seems as, as even just the last few weeks here, there's some, some signs that the economy is going to shift very quickly toward a, a green economy. A lot of investments are being pushed that way, and you, you'd already mentioned, uh, mentioned around sort of commodity registers already picking up on this. Um, so it looks like these questions are going to be asked really quickly, um, and you know, left movements and, and folks that are fighting uh, for justice need to think about this a lot and figure out what kind of strategies we're going to take. Um, I guess as we lead into this conversation, maybe we're pivoting a little bit, maybe to like the political and the sort of active pieces of, of your work and thought, but is there a way forward to do a, uh, a green economy that does have far more elements of justice in it than what we presently have? Yeah, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna answer this question in a way that I think connects it to Heather's question, which is the second one in the Q&A, which you might have been asking this question independently of that. So you can tell me if there's pieces that I don't get to, but I, the way that she frames it, which I think is a useful way to frame it, and the way that I, I do myself, is what would a less resource intensive version of, of a renewable powered economy look like, right? And, and the reason that I think that I, I want to just dwell on this resource intensive part, because I, I think it may not be immediately obvious to everyone in the room, like, why is that the way to look at it? Because I, you know, I think that when, when I started this project on lithium, I was drawn to it because of the way that I felt torn by it, right? It's like, on the one hand, I am a, you know, advocate, as I think we all probably are given the theme of, of this, um, of, of this um, uh, series, that I'm an advocate of really rapid, aggressive, and wide-scale decarbonization within the U.S., um, and I'm an advocate of that because of climate change in general, but also because I think of the particular responsibility of the global north to move very quickly on reducing its carbon footprint because it has a historic responsibility and a contemporary responsibility to do so in terms of global equity, right? So it's like full steam ahead, let's like electrify everything, let's swap in the solar panels, let's, you know, uh, redo our built environment to create more density, you know, let's do all these things as fast as possible. Um, and so that's one part of me. And then the other part of me is I, I went to these places in, in Chile um, and then layered onto my pre-existing field work in Ecuador, you know, some of which had to do with copper, which is another key input for the green economy. And I've seen the devastation um, and I consider myself in solidarity with communities and specific movements that are, that are mobilizing around this devastation. The devastation that a really rapid and unintentionally thought out shift to um, to renewable energy um, and, and green technology might not might um, might portend for these extractive zones right it might just be more of the same of this 500 year kind of you know colonial or racial capitalism for them right and 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 and, and again not just in the global south because this extraction does and will take place um, um, within the US and, and Canada and Europe and elsewhere as well so so how do I, you know, so this is what drew me to the project. It was this feeling of being torn, but, you know, being torn is uncomfortable. So one wants to kind of like work through this, like, is this totally in opposition? Is it the case that dealing with climate change means localized harm? It seems like a bad, a bad deal. Um, and so the reason that I like um, Heather's question is that I think that there is a way to square the circle. Um, it doesn't, the way that we square the circle is not by thinking and I wanna say something that I hope is not controversial, though it could be. Um, I don't think it's by thinking that we can have a zero extraction economy. I don't, I don't think that that's viable. I think A of all human beings, um, like any other animal, like exists in some meta metabolism with nature. We, we use things from nature. Um, we enjoy things, products of nature. The question is like, 
you know, what volume, who sets the terms, like, do we think about regeneration, like under what conditions do we interact with nature, right? So I'm not trying to go for a situation in which there's zero extraction, which I think is different than saying zero extractivism, which is a system of intensified extraction. I think we can get out of extractivism, but I don't think we can get out of extraction. So I think as eco-socialists, or I, I consider myself that, um, maybe not everyone does, but but as, as you know, climate leftists and progressive at, at, at the least, like, how do we approach extraction in a way that is just in Nick's terms or less resource intensive in Heather's terms? And I think that, you know, one is to think about ways, and this happens through social policy, social and climate policy. This happens through technological choices, manufacturing choices, and end of life choices, meaning um, recycling and recovery choices. Um, there are all these different places at which we can make decisions, collective decisions, to use less and still make sure that everyone has enough to flourish and that what we do use is equitably distributed. So let me give you an easy example. I've been speaking in kind of vague generalities, maybe. I'll get much more concrete now. So I think that one of the worst outcomes of, um, one of the worst possible outcomes of the way that we're going about this energy transition right now globally is a situation in which we electrify transit by and make it zero carbon with the expectation that as many people as possible own electric vehicles. And the reason that this is a problem is because one electric vehicle, a passenger individual electric vehicle, um, like a Tesla or a Chevy Volt or whatever, like, is, is a very, very mineral intensive. I and mean, we're talking about hundreds of pounds of minerals that went into make this, this, um, this car. And for the most part, especially during a pandemic, but let's forget about the pandemic for a moment, that car just sits in a garage all day. You, you commute with it, it sits on a parking spot. You come home with it, it sits in a garage. Like it is just an extremely ecologically irrational use of resources, right? Whereas let's take a bus. Now the bus battery is slightly bigger. The bus frame is slightly bigger more resources go into making a bus than a Tesla. However, in a dense urban environment under non-pandemic conditions, you might have thousands of people that use that bus, cycle through that bus in a day, right? And yes, it's parked maybe for a little bit overnight, depending if you have a 24 hour transit system, you get the idea. Many more people benefit from the materials that are extracted and all of the effort um, and some of the environmental harm that went into that extraction is distributed over many more people. It's a more socially and, and ecologically rational use of those resources. Even better um, would be a situation in which vehicles are not the only way we get around, right? And I understand that there are absolutely mobility issues and I don't wanna say that everyone can ride a bike or walk, but some people can, and in some context that can make sense, right? So just thinking more broadly about what would a transit system look like that is less resource intensive? It would look like mass transit, walkability, and cycling in some combination. Um, and I just want to pause here briefly to speak to the folks in the room whose number one concern is emissions, right? Because I'm, I'm talking right now in more like non-emissions environmental terms, talking about resource use and ecosystem impact. But I know, and they should be out there, there are carbon hawks in the room, right? And they're like, we just really wanna get the carbon down and maybe everyone having a Tesla is the best way to do that. I think that that's also incorrect. And there's great research on this that I'm happy to share with the group afterwards if people want that in fact, a, a, um, a transit policy that focuses on everyone having an electric vehicle is actually the slowest and least efficient way to decarbonize transit because the more cars you have on the road, it sounds intuitive, but people have done scientific studies as well to make this point clear. The more cars you have on the road, the harder it is to decarbonize. You have to switch each and every one of them for an EV. Whereas the more you have people consuming collectively, back to some of that stuff we were talking about with Julia Steinberger, the more you think about collective consumption, shared resources, um, uh, public infrastructure and public built environments, the more that we are kind of thinking at that scale, the fewer resources actually we need to use when we're using them together. Um, and so I think that that's one, that's been a big paradigm shift for me to just think holistically about the entire sector, in this case, transit, and like, what would be a transit sector that is equitable in terms of mobility and access and all and social and all the things that we care about, um, but also not resource intensive. And I actually think my argument is what is most equitable in a social sense, um, in the ways that Nick, I think was pointing to is also less resource intensive. Um, but we do have to think about both pieces at once and not just per se assume that that will be the case. 
Great. Um, so then you kind of ask a follow up uh, around that. So given the astounding volume of resources that have already been extracted and discarded, what role could utilizing present stockpiles of waste play in the sort of scale transitions you're describing? Why not mine our own piles of waste? And does anybody seriously analyze this? I don't know if this is in your, your research areas at all or if you can come across anything, but. Yeah, I not it's not my primary area, but I but it's something that I'm learning more about. Um, I am not sure about, so, so there are, so actually let me take a step back and answer this differently. There are places in the world that are much, that have a much more highly developed, institutionalized and elaborate system, social system of material recovery, partly partly from waste um, and, and certainly from in general end of, end of life, end of product life processes. Um, and that is primarily in, um, in Asia and particularly um, in, in Southeast Asia. Now, I wanted to say at the outset that that system of material recovery and recycling and the economies that exist around that, like, you know, people that make a living that way from, you know, the sort of lowest level of people that are working in basically trash heaps to the level of like someone who is a trader in recycled goods, that is an extremely inequitable system that is produces a lot of toxic harm to especially laborers and communities that live near these recycling routes. However, it could be done in a much cleaner way, especially if the global north wasn't constantly like offshoring its toxic waste on, on, onto Asia. So there's a lot of like global questions and global equity questions here. But the point is there are societies that actually do reuse much more, reuse and recover much more than like the US or Europe do, for example. Europe right now, it's an interesting time to ask this question because the EU is um, implementing a regulation that will require a certain amount of recovered material to be in batteries. Um, and they are doing this under the banner of what they call a circular economy. The reason I'm kind of putting that in scare quotes is because a lot of um, more radical environmentalists and progressive environmentalists have really questioned like how circular the economy approaches in, in the EU and, and whether this battery regulation is really good enough. And in fact, just full disclosure, I'm working with some advocacy, advocacy groups in Europe to press for something better than what the EU is currently proposing. But the EU is proposing that starting in, I don't know if it's 2025 or six, but every year starting at a certain point, more and more of a battery has to have recycled content. And in addition that there's gonna be a certain carbon footprint threshold for batteries. So the EU is looking at this in large part because they, I think for a few different reasons. One is I think they think that green consumers so-called green consumers care about this type of thing, which may be true. I'm not sure actually, but, but anyway, they think that, but actually more important than that, my sense is that they're doing this to, um, to compete with China. And that might not be immediately apparent why that is, but I think in, in the perspective of European policymakers and also U S policymakers in a Biden administration, one way that, that, like Europe, the US, the UK can like recoup some of like the manufacturing power that in their view, China has like dominated and stolen from them. I mean, it's a totally ridiculous narrative of, but you know, just in their perspective, this is what's happened. The way that they can compete with China uh, is not by like the scale of manufacturing, which obviously China has mastered, but um, through more sustainable methods, right? And so there's this interesting way, and I'm just, this is something I'm discovering in my research right now. So this is like a very preliminary finding and a hypothesis, right? So don't, don't like, they're not written in stone uh, uh, and it's an in-process development. But one reason for all of the sudden attention to like sustainability of green technology among elite policymakers in the global North is because they see it as a terrain on which they are more competitive potentially than China. It's kind of paradoxical because there's actually much more recycling in China than there is in Europe. But I think that the EU thinks that they can do it better there. I'm not actually sure what they're thinking because it, it's not, it, to me, it's not the most well thought out thing. But the geopolitics aside, I like that at least the EU is starting to try to incentivize more recycling. And I do think there is a lot of conversation around recycling of the metals uh, and minerals that are in batteries. There's some new recycling plants being opened in the US for lithium ion batteries. Um, the question is the thorny kind of economic question, which just shows how capitalism kind of screws us over, 
over whenever we try to do something better like use recovered materials is that right now it is currently cheaper to buy mined materials than it is to recover some of the materials like lithium recovered lithium the market price for it, it, it it's not competitive with the market price for just quote unquote virgin i hate the term but it's just the term that's used raw materials right um, because lithium is rather inexpensive right now compared to cobalt or nickel, which are more expensive on the market. So recycling them is more economic, is more economic, right? And so there are all these ways that like the profit motive gets in the way of a circular economy. And that's why as the EU is doing, though not forcefully enough in my opinion, but anyway, um, that's why you have to force it through regulation. You can't just rely on market incentives to, to generate a circular economy, but there's much more that can be done. And lab and factory results show that you can have really good, like 95% level of material recovery from batteries. So, so one other thing I'm just gonna throw out there just cause you have the type of audience that would be interested in this little detail. There is a little bit of a tension. I don't wanna overplay it, but just to put it out there between reuse and recycling. And the reason I say that is because one cool thing that you can do with a Tesla battery or a bus battery is use it in a renewable grid because it actually doesn't, it, a, a battery that's kind of spent as a car battery still functions as a grid battery because it doesn't need to charge and discharge as rapidly. Anyway, um, but if you route all the batteries to reuse, then you don't incentivize the building up of recycling capacity. So there are these interesting dilemmas that people that are know about recycling and, and material science are better than me to talk about. But the fact is we need to do it. We need to do it through regulation, um, but that scientifically and technically it's quite feasible to reuse a lot of these materials. There's a comment in the, uh, the chat from David Hawley uh, says in the US, we use the equivalent of a service area of Connecticut for parking for cars that are sitting there 90% of the time. Each Tesla, even as prices come down, is a big, increasingly unobtainable expense for most families at several hundred square uh, dollars per square foot yeah. of the garage is a big add to a housing cost. Oh, yeah. I mean, I just want to say about parking because it drives me crazy. Um, uh, in, I live in Providence, um, uh, Rhode Island, uh, and I once saw a map of all of the, some environmental group did this amazing map of all of the parking spaces downtown. And there's like more parking spaces than like buildings downtown. Like there's so many parking spaces, parking lots, you know, municipal parking spots. And it's like, that's the reason everyone drives downtown because you know, you can park. Like I never, you never have to look for a parking spot. Whereas if actually that was all converted into other land, land uses and streetscape uses and park parklets and green spaces, people would instead, you know, take a bus or an Uber or whatever it is. But, but parking spaces incentivize driving just like building more highways does. I mean, it's all connected as your, as the folks uh, in the chat obviously know, but I just wanted to throw that out there. Yeah, and I mean, resiliency in cities is also a big issue that's coming up and we need actual like not pavement a lot of exactly time exactly a resiliency time. and adaptation in terms of the weather the, the the temperatures right which we know that these heat islands affect communities of color and working class communities um more than anyone but you know it, on the, with august temperatures like they are in the northeast right now um the pavement is a big part of the problem yep you heard it from the uh depave your your streets all of at once um maybe we so we're about five and um you know people in the chat keep the the questions coming i wonder if we can kind of pivot to some of the political projects that you're involved in if you're sure if you're talking to them about them and of course. just um sort of like where are you putting your energy what's what kind of theories of change are you working with right now um in the sort of like short medium and long term where do you think we can as you know, I'll count myself in the eco-socialist camp here as, as a way of describing this, where, where can we make the biggest gains possible for a, a Green New Deal and a just transition? Yeah, so I kind of work on two tracks that I like to see as connected, but they are different parts of my day or week or whatever it is. Um, and I'm gonna mention them both, but I'm gonna talk about the domestic one a little bit more, um, just cause I think that like the on-ramps to involvement in that are a little more straightforward. But the two places that I, spend my time thinking about and doing activist work. One is this kind of global solidarity piece, which I've referred to a few times. Some of that has to do with like specific relationships that I have with movements or groups or organizations um, in Latin America that I've researched with or collaborated with um, uh, over the many years. Um, so that's, that's one kind of um, angle on the global stuff. Um, 
Uh, in addition, there's a, a campaign that I participate in uh, run at by Earthworks, which is a really cool, um, pretty left wing as, as they go like environmental um, NGO based in DC that coordinates this amazing campaign that I just, I'm like so glad it exists because it's exactly what I research and what I would want to exist if it didn't, but they've coordinated it. So it does, which is it's something like making the clean energy transition equitable, just and uh, making sure the energy transition is equitable, just, and clean, something like that. I You can look it up and it's easy to find. But basically this campaign coordinates across frontline communities and uh, nonprofits and organizations around the world that are different nodes of these supply chains, right? So there are folks that participate from Latin America, from Europe, from the Democratic Republic of Congo, um, from the Philippines, from China, because each of those places that I just mentioned are places where there is either significant extraction uh, of these uh, raw materials for green technologies, or um, there are significant markets for them or manufacturing of them, right? So this campaign kind of brings these advocacy groups together. And that's the setting in which, as I was mentioning earlier, we're trying to create some public statements around that EU um, uh, process, right? So that's the that that kind of work that I do, not just through Earthworks, but through other organizations as well, is kind of more globally oriented. In the US, um, as I already mentioned, I'm very active in DSA, and we are about to launch um, our National Green New Deal campaign. So this is a very good time to ask me this question. Um, uh, we've already like had some soft kind of internal launches and things like that. So it's not, not like telling you something that is secret, but regardless, it's, it's going to publicly launch um, uh, in, in uh, less than a week, actually, um, which is one of the things making my life very hectic. And I really like that you asked, Nick, what is our theory of change? Thanks. And thanks for defining that in the, um, in the chat. Um, so what is our theory of change? And, and just for people that haven't thought about that concept before, what a theory of change is, is a theory of how you organize to win something, right? And theories of change um, uh, are, are particularly important for groups that are, um, uh, that are not uh, among the powerful elite to think about, right? Because there's an immediate challenge if you are not someone that already has a tremendous amount of power in society, if you're not already like a senator or a CEO or whatever, there's this challenge of like, I have a political project that I think would benefit lots of people, but like, how do we actually organize against the intense impediments and obstacles and inequalities that make such organizing difficult, right? And so if you find yourself in such a situation, you need to have some overarching theory of like, what is your capacity? What is your leverage? Um, how are you gonna influence decision makers? Who are you going to target? Um, what groups are you gonna try to empower and activate to get involved? And like, what are your end goals, right? And so all of that is kind of what, how we think about things in DSA. And um, in, in our Green New Deal campaign, we've, I think, you know, struggled over, we've, we've been, uh, we've had a Green New Deal campaign process for a while now. Um, it's been a priority of the organization, but we've sort of thought like, okay, how are we gonna win this transformative huge thing, right? It's almost hard, it's not just, has, this has nothing to actually do with DSA in particular, but any group trying to think about how are we gonna win a Green New Deal? It's almost like brain exploding because it's like something bigger than the New Deal. It's something bigger than in some ways World War II mobilization, right? It's something that the US has never done before that no society has ever really done before, which is like completely transition the energy source uh, completely transform the built environment and do so all with an, a very attentive eye to social equity and to actually transforming power relations at the same time. And that is a lot of moving parts um, and requires, I think is immediately obvious um, for those of us with kind of an awareness of, of movement and policy history, it would require like a really massive mobilization of ordinary people, right? We're not going to expect the same policymakers that have screwed us over with climate chaos and with climate denial and with incrementalism and market-based idea, you know, whether it's Democrats or Republicans, like we really can't trust the political system to do this for us. So we know that this involves mass movement of people, right? And to do so in the next 10 years or nine years as it were, right? So this is like an urgent and, and um, broad process. And it's not something that, you know, if it were, if we didn't care about the social equality piece, if it was just a rapid, transformation, 
we might think, okay, some technocratic elite can just handle this for us. But we do care about the equality piece, not just because we're ethical and we care uh, about, you know, pe everyone having um, uh, uh, enough to thrive. Um, you know, it's not just because of an ethical reason. I think it's also because of like a structural analysis that says part of the reason for the climate crisis is this highly unequal capitalist system that we live under, right? So, so we can't really address the climate crisis without also chipping away at, hopefully pretty dramatically, uh, the forms of inequality, class and racial that, that, um, that are all around us in the US and in the world, right? Okay, so we need mass mobilization of people because elites are not gonna just hand us a Green New Deal. And so the question is how, and I won't go through all of the possible options. I'll just tell us where we've landed on this question. And part of the reason it took a little while, and, and honestly, I'm, I'm involved in other groups that, or, or in spaces where there are other groups working on the Green New Deal. I think it's taken everyone a little while. And part of the reason was the political landscape was very uncertain for many months, right? We didn't know if Biden or Trump would win. Well, first of all, we didn't know who's going to win the primary. Then we didn't know who's going to win the general. It was very, you know, seemed very tight at a moment. Then we didn't know who's going to win the Senate, right? So now, okay, we have the political landscape down. We know who the appointees are. We know who's in power. And now we can really start targeting decision makers. But it's still a question of who are you mobilizing to do so? And what might sound counterintuitive, maybe not, depending where people are at politically um, in the room, um, is that what we've decided in DSA is that we can't imagine a transformation of the kind that we're that we're thinking about envisioning with a with a transformative Green New Deal happening without um, the involvement of organized labor. And the reason that we can't imagine that is, first of all, the history of the original New Deal suggests the importance of labor militancy. But also because, and I think what I'm about to say will resonate with folks in the room um, who are climate, you know, in the climate world, um, is that um, the the often simplified, often stereotyped, um, uh, uh, and sometimes sometimes very misleading, but nonetheless pervasive idea that there is a divide between the environmentalists and the labor folks, or like the working class and environmentalists, or between like the green energy proponents and like fossil fuel workers, whatever, however it, you know, is specified, that the idea that that divide exists, and to the extent that it does empirically in reality, is, I believe, and we believe in DSA, has been like a real stumbling block for the climate movement. Because imagine if we had a situation, even, even given where labor is at right now, which is not great, I'll come back to that in a moment, um, if we had a situation in which organized labor was much more gung-ho about the Green New Deal, I think the things would be slightly different, right? So we're kind of thinking, we need organized labor to be in this fight with us, and we, therefore, need to be in the fight with organized labor, right? Because solidarity is a two-way street. It is not a, just about wanting people to show up for you. It is about creating relationships of trust and reciprocity. And so all of this long spiel is to say, this was all a setup to say the following, which is what we are focusing on in our Green New Deal campaign is a piece of legislation. So the first like phase of our Green New Deal campaign will be a piece of legislation that is um, go, will be likely up soon for a vote in Congress, which is called the PRO Act. And I don't know if people know what the PRO Act is. Some of you probably do because you're like political junkies, but some of you might not. What the PRO Act, but everyone will know about it soon because it'll be all over the news, but you heard it here first. Uh, what the PRO Act is, is the Protect the Right to Organize Act. Protect the Right to Organize, it's an acronym. And what it does is reverse like decades of corporate assaults on on unionization in the US, which have made the US the hardest place in the so-called developed world to organ to join a union or organize a union, right? You just face retaliation from the boss. Just look at what Amazon is doing to the organizers in Alabama right now, like all sorts of insane tactics to prevent people from joining a union. And that happens in any workplace where people try to organize. So we think that if the power of labor to actually organize working class people was unleashed, was uninhibited by these legalized constraints, especially in right so-called right to work states, which are 27, so more than half of the states in the US are right to work, if that power was unleashed, we could start to see labor come into its own as like a collective actor with political demands like it had in the New Deal era. And in the New Deal era, just by the way, labor didn't articulate those political demands sort of in a vacuum. It articulated them in deep relationship and conversation with communists and socialists, right? With, with radical leftists that became very involved in the labor movement and involved in strategizing. So 
Not to say history will repeat itself. We have a very different working class now, a much more a multiracial working class, one that is very female led, one that has a huge amount of immigrants, not that there weren't immigrants then, but more immigrants now. And so the working class looks different. The sectors look different. It's more service workers versus manufacturing. I'm not trying to say we're going back to the 1930s. That would be a really silly, um, you know, kind of, uh, you know, flattening of history. But it is to say that a revived militant labor movement for us as socialists in DSA is key to winning things like the Green New Deal, like Medicare for all, like any of these big demands that have just felt so like they're popular, but we can't get them. It's like everyone wants these things, but we can't get them. The reason why is because you need collective power and leverage over, over decision making and the labor unions are key to that. And I will just end with this last bit. Um, which is that the rest of our Green New Deal campaign after this initial big push around the PRO Act is to focus on two other demands, which are a big green public bailout, like a big green public infrastructure, um, but with the public sector really involved and hopefully forms of public ownership involved um, for cities and, and states and localities. And then a green jobs guarantee is another big demand of ours, which is also really in the national conversation right now in interesting ways. So. That's our Green New Deal campaign in a nutshell. That's all I think about all day when I'm not thinking about the lithium stuff, uh, which is kind of related, but anyway. So um, we'll be launching soon. I'm happy to help folks get involved if they're interested. Um, but yeah, sorry for that really long answer to your question, but there's, it's a big campaign, has a few different moving parts. So um, a great answer. That out. Great answer. And uh, I would say at Breach Collective, our theory of change is very similar. I mean, yeah. even within the, the kind of like climate nonprofit world, we were experiencing enormous <laughs> problems that our former organizations even trying to unionize. And, uh, uh, yeah. you know, we saw it as like an enormously important thing to just be able to be in the room with organized labor is to, to be mm. organized labor ourselves. And, right. you know, for me, when I was watching the Bernie campaign, I had the same thing, even though I primarily work in the climate field, all the most exciting parts of Bernie's platform were all in labor, they were transformative in terms of uh, what it would do to the working class in the United States to allow more agency politically. And so I think I think it's a, a great entry point. And just so folks, while we're on this topic, if folks wanna get involved with that and either like DSA or DSA socialist, what's the best way to do that? Yeah, I'm gonna put a, don't even worry, I'm gonna put a, I'm gonna put a form in the chat. <laughs> um, and, um, um, and folks are, um, I'll put two different websites. One is just like getting involved with DSA and the other is specific to, um, to the campaign. Um, and I believe the campaign uh, interest form, you can fill out even if you're not a DSA member. I think that there's a check mark there. So don't be discouraged by that. Um, uh, there's, there's a couple yeah. questions sort of Please. back up in the chat here. Mm -hmm. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna try to paraphrase them and put them together, but they're um, basically looking at the difference between kind of what sits at the in the federal resolution is what the Green New Deal might be versus maybe like what a left mm -hmm. version mm -hmm. would be of a Green New Deal. And um, specifically, Shri asks, we speak a little bit more to the equity aspects of a Green New Deal um, and yeah. what, like a left, more left position would be on that. Yeah, great. Um, so um, a couple of thoughts. One is, I think one of the most important missing pieces of the original Green New Deal resolution, the, the um, AOC Markey one um, that came out in, what was it, February 2019. The biggest missing piece, and I, I, um, I, I, I think that probably people will agree with me pretty immediately on this, was that it didn't address fossil fuels at all. Now, the reason that it didn't address fossil fuels is a complex question. I don't think it's just like political cowardice, though I think there was a sense of like, we're picking a lot of battles with just with this resolution as it is, let's not get the most powerful enemy right immediately, like, you know, on us, right? So it's sort of like, we're gonna defer this fossil fuel question to get some sort of social and political consensus around the Green New Deal framework. Okay, so I, I think there was a political calculation. I also think there might've been, and, and I feel like I've sort of read some reporting or heard about this maybe in movement spaces that were involved that like, there was a concern around labor to come back to that question, which was there was a concern around alienating the energy unions within the AFL-CIO, for example, um, some of the building trades unions who are actually, I think, quite winnable and movable, and we could talk about that, but some of their locals are, are do work that is more directly related to the fossil fuel economy, right? So sort of like, let's not first get fossil fuel capitalists on us immediately, and also let's not alienate um, uh, some of the labor unions that we want to bring around to this. So, but it was 
it was, I think, in some ways a missed opportunity to speak bluntly, honestly, and directly about the need to confront fossil capitalism and specifically to do so in a way that is just, right? To speak to the equity question, though I know that had some different valences to it, which I'll get to in a second. But, um, you know, I, I, you could you could talk and you can talk and should talk about like nationalizing the fossil fuel sector. I think that you know nationalizing can be a scary word within the U.S., but we have a sector that is in um, in crisis in many ways. Like fossil fuel prices are are low because of the pandemic um, uh, situation, um, and among other reasons, and it, it and there's these energy transitions happening all over the world, and the sector is vulnerable, and it is actually a good time for you know some forced buyouts or some straight up expropriation. However, you know, I mean, there's different ways to do nationalization and not, and some of them can happen through negotiation and some of them, you know, are more forceful. But the point is you can take over the sector as a public government. And there are many examples of this in the past um, with oil particularly and, and, with, and with mining and other strategic sectors and take it over and also then through that have a phase out that is just for workers, right? And so you can actually address the labor piece by confronting head on uh, fossil fuel bosses um, specifically and, and asset holders. So that was a missed opportunity. Um, what else was a missed opportunity? From my perspective, there was a missed opportunity, um, uh, but I think that these missed opportunities are less missed now, like the, these conversations have really been filled in since the resolution. But one thing I would push on the resolution about would be more of a role for public ownership in the energy sector um, and or, or maybe more of a more of a, um, a political analysis that connected, as we're seeing so clearly in Texas, that the, the sort of logic of, of markets and privatization and deregulation in our energy sector, how bad that has been for climate and how bad that has been for communities and for ratepayers, right? So I think that there was a way to kind of like bring in a conversation that's hard to do in the US, but the GND resolution would have been a good moment for it to talk about public ownership in the energy system. You know, those two criticisms aside, I do think that a lot of that conversation has happened since then. And I've been actually impressed with both on the fossil fuel nationalization front and on the public power front, there have been like a lot more dialogue about, about both of those things than honestly when I started myself as an activist working on some of these issues. So in, in 2017 in Providence DSA, we started a campaign around public power. And that was just, it was like almost hard to explain to people what it was. But now like it's, it's you know, there are a lot more demands for that around the country, especially given events, recent events in California with PG&E and in Texas with ERCOT. So, um, so those are some things that come to mind. Um, with the equity, you know, I think I see it as such an, an opportunity. Um, thank you, Shri, for that question. Because I think that when we have a moment where we are calling for major transformations in our built environment, um, in our housing stock, in our um, uh, transit, in our energy grids, in our agricultural system, which I haven't even touched on. That's you know my own lack of expertise in that area, but obviously totally central to the climate crisis and to these equity issues. Um, in all of these areas, when we talk about wanting to transform them, it is a big task, um, but it also politically to, to push and demand for and, and get what we deserve. But I think it is this opportunity to think really intentionally in all of the ways that Sri laid out around like, how does the existing system of housing, of transit, of the energy grid, of agriculture, how do those existing of, of, of education, you know, lot, lots of systems that we could talk about, how does that existing system both exacerbate the climate crisis, which all of those existing built infrastructures do, and also exacerbate the crisis of social and economic inequality, right? And so I think the genius of the Green New Deal is to see how connected those two things are. Um, but, you know, the Green New Deal, as per Nick's question, you know, maybe drawn from the chat, is just like the beginning of a conversation of how to do that, right? So, um, you know, if we think about housing in particular, and this is an area that my uh, close collaborator, Daniel Aldana Cohen, works a lot on, and I super suggest looking at his work. He was one of the, he led the research um, for the bill that became a Green New Deal for public housing that was introduced by AOC um, uh, last legislative session. So, you know, there there's a lot of interesting work happening on green housing. And I think green social housing, social housing is not a word we use that much in the US, you could say public housing, you could say affordable housing, whatever, but green, I like green social housing. Um, green social housing is this idea that housing is a right, housing is a human right, everyone deserves shelter, and more than shelter, everyone deserves a wonderful place to call home. 
Um, and we actually have a shortage of housing in the US. We have a housing crisis and we have a homelessness crisis in the US and, and those are connected. Those are connected to the ways that we regulate or don't regulate you know, real estate markets and, 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 uh, and land markets. Um, and the fact that the government has really just not stepped in and has really neglected and abdicated this role to provide housing where it doesn't exist, right? So there's a real need for housing. We're seeing a crisis in evictions related to the pandemic, but predating the pandemic. Um, and so we need more housing, but what a wonderful opportunity to also address the issues of climate and energy through our housing stock, right? So in many cities, uh, like New York City, for example, housing is a big housing and buildings in general is like a big source of emissions, right? Because housing is where we route all of our electricity, our, our energy, our gas, heating, all the stuff that creates emissions currently. Um, and so if you are building new housing or retrofitting existing housing, you might as well make it as green as possible, right? And so you can do green and affordable at the same time. Now, let me get to a few other of Shri's points because I think this is also about immigration and it's also about feminism and it's also about disability, right? So there are other reasons to focus on green social housing as a very effective policy intervention. We know, and it's already happening, that there's gonna be tremendous climate related migration. That migration is always first and foremost within countries, people moving to escape rising seas or floods um, uh, or too hot weather within a country and moving somewhere else. But that migration often becomes transnational as well as we're seeing from Central America, elsewhere in the world as well. So th what that means is that at any given moment as history moves forward, we're gonna have like masses of people arriving in places without housing stock, right? And so migration is another reason to think preemptively about building more green, social, affordable housing. And then I just want to get to the, the feminism and, and disability pieces, which is that the other cool thing about thinking about housing from a social perspective as like something that we collectively provision is that you can actually, um, and, and there are cities that do this already, and it's really quite amazing, um, implement feminist design principles. And actually feminist design principles are also more eco-friendly because one of the key things about feminist design, it's about thinking from the perspective of caretakers, which don't have to necessarily be women, but often are women in our society. Um, and like, what would make their life easier? Would it be easier maybe to have like the childcare center right there, to have a grocery store right nearby, to have a public library right next to where you live, right? To have this density of, of services and, and different centers that are helpful for caretaking um, responsibilities, right? And so there are feminist urban um, designers and architects that think about how to use buildings to meet the different needs of care in our society, right? And so, and, and there, it's also more eco-friendly because that means less car driving to do all of those things because they're all like co-located in the same place. And then the disability piece, I'm so glad you brought that up because I think, you know, a real, uh, um, disability is just a way, it's a, it, 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 one thing I think that's amazing about disability activism and disability uh, like sort of academic literature as well, is that it's a lens to think about our society and look at how to make it as equitable and accessible as possible, right? And it turns out that when you do, when you make changes in the built environment that help a particular disabled population, let's say people that use wheelchairs, right? So you put ramps everywhere that actually helps lots of other people, right? Because if you have any mobility issues, even if it's temporary, like you're on a crutch or you have a sprained ankle, it's nice to have a ramp, right? So I, this is just a little example to illustrate a broader point, which is that when we look at the built environment through the lens of equity, through the lens of feminism, of caretaking and of disability, we can transform the built environment in ways that are actually better for everybody, but also I think are better for the environment um, and, and, and more energy efficient. Um, and, and, in, and even, and this is the most aspirational thing that I will say, um, create forms of public spaces and public life that are just less resource intensive to go all the way back to Heather's question that actually like give us places to just hang out and have social relationships and do art and have fun that are not all mediated through hyper consumption, right? So all of these dots connect. I don't wanna sound like overwhelming. I more wanna say that like, just when we look at one thing like housing, we can see how much can be done to make it greener and more equitable. And it has all of these other, maybe even unintended in some cases, um, effects on, um, on social life that I think would be beneficial.
Yeah, we've got time for one more question. There's two really good questions and I'm gonna defer one of them to a later session. So Kate asks basically about how do we do this kind of stuff in Republican areas? And, and there's gonna be a lot of content later on in this class about like how to organize, how to campaign pretty much anywhere that we can fight pretty much on any terrain. And, and there's some folks from uh, Memphis, Tennessee who are gonna tell you about fighting an oil pipeline in the deep South in a Republic. I mean, it's a, it's a left-ish leaning city, but like, in a Republican legislature and all the rest. And, and we'll talk about fossil fuel fights as well. Um, so from Nayeli Jimenez, she asks, uh, mitigation is a huge part of dealing with existing inequalities exacerbated by climate change. How does this fit into the Green New Deal? Do you think it will come organically if the Green New Deal is implemented successfully or does it have to be part of our key demands? So I think um, I would almost like to go to the um, question asker to make sure I understand what they mean by mitigation, I'll say what I mean, what I think it means, um, but they might be working with a different definition. So my understanding, there are these kind of like um, three main buckets of, of climate policy when we think about emissions specifically, mitigation, adaptation, and resiliency. Uh, they're not mutually exclusive, but they're out there as these three concepts. When we talk about mitigation, usually it means reducing emissions. Um, it can also mean, uh, sucking the carbon out of the air that's already there with technology that hasn't you know, fully been scaled yet. But regardless, it's about reducing emissions, whether through negative emissions technology or through just cutting emissions um, by transitioning to renewable energy. So that's mitigation. Adaptation is the idea that we have a lot of um, adaptation and resiliency might be kind of similar. I think both of them are kind of formed from the idea that there's a lot of climate chaos already built into, the, already baked in, as it were. Like, you know, we have all of this historic emission in the atmosphere. And even if we dramatically ramp emissions down and we come up with carbon sucking machines, we're still going to be suffering from climate chaos. So we need to adapt, right? So that could look like something like moving people away from shorelines that might be dangerous or flood planes that might be dangerous or areas that are getting overly hot or desert desertified, uh, like, you know, drought. Um, and so it's moving, actually physically moving communities that brings up a huge amount of equity issues that I think, you know, are sort of obviously quite fraught. And then there's resiliency, which I don't know, I'm not, you know, I'm actually, believe it or not, not a climate expert, like it's not my background area of expertise. I've come to it through Green New Deal activism. So, you know, I'm learning and you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, the, the Nayeli or anyone else, but I think of resiliency is kind of in between. It's not just like, adaptation, like taking for granted that this terrible thing is going to happen. So we have to just adapt to it. And it's not mitigation, which is the idea that we can prevent the terrible harm from happening. It's like making our communities more resilient against to, to, to sort of weather the terrible harms, right? So it's kind of in between in my brain, but I might not have this right um, adaptation and mitigation. That all being said, I think the Green New Deal is a lot about mitigation. It's probably been more about mitigation than anything else because it's the idea that we need to rapidly transition to renewable energy, which would have the effect of mitigation. Um, it's maybe thought less about those negative emissions technologies. So I'm not sure if that's partly where the question is coming from. Um, and, um, uh, uh, and, and maybe it's also thought less about, like I said earlier, like stopping fossil fuel extraction, which was a big hole in the original resolution. So it's not as, so that would be a big piece of mitigation for me is leaving it in the ground. And so maybe that's where the, I'm not a hundred percent sure where the question is coming from. Just, not that it's not a good question, just that I, I think that mitigation is quite central to a Green New Deal, but it's possible that we have different definitions of mitigation. So I'm not sure if that was helpful or not. Great. We are almost at 530 and I will try to be good about your time. So thank you so much for joining us, Thea. Uh, it was really interesting from our perspective and I learned a ton as usual. Um, Thea's got a great Twitter account. I would recommend following <laughs> as well. She's always either put, posting original content or retweeting really, really interesting stuff. Um, any kind of places you want to direct people before they they, yeah, you know. I will. I'll do this because the first, I think the very first time I posted it, I did that mistake of just posting it to panelists, which are just the three of us. So I'll repost it to attendees. Those are some links. So the first one is like,
you're already a DSA member or you feel comfortable enough with like DSA-ness to be like, I'm just going to fill out this form. I'm interested in joining this pro act and green new deal campaign. That's the first link. The second link is like, I don't know anything about DSA. I'd love to join whatever join DSA. That's the second link. The third link is more so if you're already a member and you don't know that we have this large eco-socialist working group, which is awesome and does a lot of our green new deal work. That's how to get involved in eco-socialist work in, in DSA. But you know, check out any of those. Um, and um, I think they're great, great ways to get involved. And again, even if you're not in DSA, you can fill out the first form and, and DSA is operating with this proact push in a big national coalition that might involve